if you are interested in learning how to play Pathfinder, especially if you're familiar with D&D, or if you're interested in learning all of the biggest differences between Pathfinder 2nd Edition and D&D 5e, then this video is for you. Welcome to D4. Hi everybody. So here at D4, most weeks we take a deep dive into a specific character build for Dungeons and & Dragons, and theorycraft about it and crunch numbers in the attempt to create a character that is both fun and powerful to play in-game. If you really love character creation for your role-playing games, then welcome home. This is where you belong. And I'm really glad that you're here, so thanks for being here. Uh, my name's Colby. Today, I'm taking a very rare break from my established norm to take a deep dive into Pathfinder. And when I say deep, I mean a deep. None of this five most important things you need to know about Pathfinder business. I am nothing if not thorough. So a lot of you have expressed interest in Pathfinder and asked me for Pathfinder content even before all of the OGL hubbub actually. And I've long been curious about the game myself ever since I played the Pathfinder Adventures deck building game with my son years ago. It was a lot of fun. I have recently jumped into my very first Pathfinder campaign with my good friend Chris from Triant Monk's Temple, among others, and guided by the very intelligent and helpful Ronald, aka the Rules Lawyer. If you would like to watch those actual play sessions, check them out here on his channel. Anyway, I've really enjoyed playing Pathfinder so far, but I don't like feeling like I don't know how anything actually works. So. I bought myself the core rulebook and have spent literally dozens of hours meticulously combing through all 600 plus pages of the core rulebook. Now I'm going to present everything that I've learned for you here in a succinct and organized fashion so that you don't have to do the same thing. Okay, fine. Full disclosure. I didn't read every single spell description or every single magic item description for that matter. And I might've skipped the lore bits but I fully intend to go back and read those bits because they're juicy bits. <laughs> that sounds a little dirty. And I might have only skimmed the GM stuff, but everything else has been thoroughly scoured. So here's the good news. If you are familiar with D&D already, then you're like 80% of the way there to being able to just jump into your first Pathfinder game. There's plenty of differences between the two systems, sure, but there are more similarities than there are differences. So understanding plus to hit and damage, armor class, rolling dice, making saving throws, difficulty checks, skill checks, leveling up, ability scores, the nuances of turn-based combat, not to mention role-playing, these things have all given you a super solid foundation to build our understanding of Pathfinder upon. My goal with this video, then, is to help you take the foundation that you already have and help you understand all of the important differences between the two systems so that, by the end of this video, you'll be ready to both create your first Pathfinder character and just jump into your first Pathfinder campaign. You might need to watch it a couple of times because there's a lot of info. I know, you're looking down at the time and you're like, over an hour long video? On YouTube? Who is this guy? But trust me, you're gonna save yourself a lot of time going this route rather than reading that 600 page core rulebook. You can always just do what most of my viewers do and crank it up to one and a half or two times speed. Or do what the rest of them do and just use it for some nice ASMR to help you fall asleep at night. Okay, here is the order in which I will be presenting the information. First up, we're gonna go into character creation info, including information about ability scores, ancestries or races in D&D, classes, skills, feats, and equipment. Then we're gonna cover combat, focusing on the actions that you can take, as well as what damage, dying, healing, and movement look like. Then we're gonna jump into spells and spellcasting, followed by conditions that a creature can be subjected to in Pathfinder and how those conditions differ from D&D. We'll finish with basically everything else that feels different and important between the two systems, but that I didn't cover in any of the previous sections. And then I'll just wrap up with my overall impressions of the game and some final thoughts. Hey everybody, coming to you from the uh, editing studio. I really wanted to try and push this Pathfinder video out sooner rather than later. I've been cramming to try to get this video done by my regular Tuesday release. Unfortunately, I'm just not finished editing it yet. It was really long 
like 50% longer than my typical videos, and I'm just still working on the editing process. So I've had to tweak my plan slightly to the following. Today, I'm going to release like part one of this series where we're gonna cover character creation and combat. Then I'm going to keep working on editing the rest of the video and release that to you tomorrow. I'll get it out as soon as I can. I'm guessing that that video is gonna be significantly shorter, probably only about 30 minutes, and that's where we're gonna go over spells, conditions, miscellaneous, wrap up final thoughts, and even throw in some outtakes at the end. I'm sorry for making you wait. Most of you are probably watching this after part two is already out, in which case, check there to get part two, and I will link it at the end of the video as well as put links in the video description. Next week, I am gonna go back to my regular D&D character creation video that I had planned on releasing today, and after that, we'll see. Finally, something that I meant to mention all along but never did, so I'll mention it here. Obviously, this is my first ever Pathfinder video. I am a total noob and am un undoubtedly going to get things wrong when I'm explaining the rules and probably leave out some important things as well. I've done my level best to avoid all of that, but I'm sure those of you who are Pathfinder veterans will spot some things, have some additions or corrections to add, and by all means I encourage you to leave those additions or corrections in the comments and I'll thank you in advance for them. Okay, that's it. Back to the video. Before we begin, let me say this. For right now, I'm only planning on using the core rulebook. I know other Pathfinder books exist, most notably the Advanced Player's Guide, and those books introduce a lot more options for player characters to choose from, as well as additional rules, etc. I'm sure they're as amazing, or maybe even better than what Tasha's Cauldron of Everything was to D&D, but we're learning the basics here, so I thought it best to just stick to the core rulebook for now. Also, for my regular regular viewers. Some of you are probably wondering if I'm going to like stop doing D&D content and switch to Pathfinder now or whatever. First off, let me just say, I have no current plans to just stop doing D&D content. Whether or not I start including some Pathfinder content after this video depends frankly on you. If this video performs really well and I get a lot of comments asking for additional Pathfinder content, then I might start to dabble a little bit in doing Pathfinder character builds alongside my D&D character builds. If those videos perform really well, then I'll probably do more. So if you like this, if you want to see more Pathfinder stuff, comment, like, subscribe if you're not already, but even, you know, share with other people who you think might find it interesting or useful. If you're not interested in more Pathfinder content, also it's important to let me know, leave a comment, but I would appreciate it if you'd just keep the video running in the background, maybe with the volume muted. That'd be awesome. <laughs> Okay, let's start at the very beginning. A very good place to start. With ability scores. In Pathfinder 2, you've got the exact same ability scores as you do in D&D. Strength, Constitution, Dexterity, Wisdom, Intelligence, and Charisma. But instead of like rolling for your ability scores or using a point by method, all of your ability scores start out at 10, which is, similar to D&D, a bonus of zero. Then, Every choice you make during character creation is simply going to add to those ability scores, including choices about your ancestry, which is Pathfinder's version of race in D&D, and is frankly a better word for it, I think. Your background gives you ability score bonuses, your class, and then you even get four more ability score bonuses to assign wherever you want. I'm not going to go into great detail on what each ability score does because for the most part they're exactly what you'd expect. Maybe with the biggest difference in my opinion being that if you're making melee weapon attacks or unarmed strikes, you always add your strength modifier to the damage roll. Finesse weapons exist as in D&D that will let you use your dexterity to hit, but bonus to damage would still rely on strength. Final note, you do get ability score increases at levels 5, 10, 15, and 20. All right, the first decision then that we're gonna need to make when creating a character would be to pick, yes, our ancestry. The PF2 core rulebook only has six ancestries. Other books introduce more, but for now, yes, we're going with the fantasy basics. Dwarf, elf, gnome, goblin, halfling, and human. In general, the ancestries in Pathfinder seem to be a little more old school in the way they kind of recommend alignment and personality types. In the core rulebook, they 
do tell you where to put your ability score bonuses based on your race, usually actually including an ability flaw as well that subtracts from one ability score. But it sounds like they've eroded that recently to go like the way of Tasha's Cauldron of Everything and say that you can just assign two ability score bonuses wherever you'd like, regardless of your race. Other than ability score bonuses, your ancestry gives you the kinds of things that you'd expect from D&D. Languages, potential extra vision capabilities, move speed, size, etc. Now, ancestry heritages are basically like sub-races. So in D&D, if you play an elf, you pick a high elf, a wood elf, a drow elf, etc., right? In Pathfinder, that is your heritage. So you might be an arctic elf, or a cavern elf, or a woodland elf. For the most part, these don't seem to have a huge impact on your character mechanically, providing little more than, say, resistance to a specific damage type or a bonus to certain saving throws in particular situations, etc. Interestingly, though, in Pathfinder, you gain what are called ancestry feats at levels 1, 5, 9, 13, and 17. We'll be talking more about feats in a minute, but for now, just know that ancestry feats, like all other feats in Pathfinder 2, as far as I can tell, do a lot more to differentiate you from another character with your same ancestry than your heritage or subrace actually does. And yeah, you're usually given a variety of ancestry feats to choose from when you get to take one, and they do have a pretty significant impact on your character's concept and mechanics. There are way too many of them to go into detail on all of them, that's something you're going to hear a lot today, but they tend to like give you proficiencies and maybe situational bonuses more often than like brand new abilities and actions to take in combat. There are of course exceptions to that. One note, if you want to be a half-elf or a half-orc, you can, but they are not a separate ancestry. Instead, you take the human ancestry, but then take the half-elf or half-orc heritage subrace. Uniquely, these heritages have a list of additional ancestry feats that are available only to them, half-elves and half-orcs. And so half-elves can take from either the usual human ancestry feats or the elf ancestry feats, or the additional exclusive to half-elf ancestry feats, for example. That may seem a little overpowered to you at first, but just know that half-elves and half-orcs don't actually get any other little bonuses or benefits from their heritage, like other heritages do for other ancestries. They just get access to a wider variety of ancestry feats. Got it? Also, at level 1, your starting hit points are based on both your ancestry and your class, giving you a much larger level 1 hit point pool. After level 1, you only gain hit points as per your class's hit die, but you get your full die of hit points every time you level, as opposed to just at level 1. So where in D&D, fighters with a hit die of D10 get 6 more hit points every level, in Pathfinder, they just get 10 more hit points every level plus your constitution modifier, naturally. In general, I do feel like players have more hit points in Pathfinder than in D&D, though monsters tend to be tougher as well. I still appreciate feeling a little less fragile, especially at those early levels. Backgrounds exist in Pathfinder, and they help you craft your character's story and grant skill proficiency, known as training, in Pathfinder, just like in D&D. But backgrounds also grant you what's called a skill feat. What's a skill feat? Good question. Before we answer it, let's talk about skills in general. Skills, I think, are both more interesting but also more complicated in Pathfinder compared to D&D 5e, and that's also a bit of a recurring theme here. The number and names of skills are pretty much the same. D&D has 18, Pathfinder has 17, but you've got athletics, insight, acrobatics, persuasion, stealth, etc. And each of them similarly benefits from a corresponding ability score modifier. Athletics is tied to strength, intimidation is tied to charisma. Now, in D&D, &D, the DM may just ask you to make a skill check for any number of things that they think might require a skill check in a certain situation. You want to walk that tightrope between those two rooftops? Sure, make an acrobatics check, DC 15. It's fairly simple. In Pathfinder, there are more often very specific actions tied to certain skills. Some of them anyone can do, whether they have proficiency or training in that skill or not. In the above, walking a tightrope, 
tightrope case, in Pathfinder the GM would have you take the balance action, which is tied to your acrobatic skill, to see if you succeed. But some special actions require that you have training in a skill before you can even attempt to do them. If you're trained in acrobatics, then you can take additional actions not available to the untrained, like squeeze that lets you get through tight spaces that would otherwise be too small for you to fit through, or maneuver in flight, which would let you perform complicated aerial maneuvers while flying if you had a fly speed that someone without acrobatics training just couldn't pull off. Every skill in game has associated untrained actions that anyone can do and trained actions that you can only do if you're trained, aka have proficiency in said skill. While we're on skills, it's important to understand that there are actually five ranks of skill proficiency in Pathfinder, as opposed to just proficient or not proficient in D&D, right? They go from untrained, which gives you a plus zero to your skill, to trained, expert, master, and finally legendary, which gives you a plus eight bonus to the skill, in addition to your associated ability score modifier, plus your character level, actually, but We'll get to that later. I've got to say, I really like how they've done this with varying levels of training or proficiency. I mean, I guess it's sort of like having either regular proficiency or being able to get expertise in D&D, but this additional skill training is just a lot more widely available to all characters. If you really want to be good in acrobatics, you can spend your leveling up resources to be so. You don't have to be a rogue or a ranger or a bard to get expertise, right? What's more, yes, you can get skill feats. Like I mentioned, you get one with your background, but then you also get another one every even numbered level. Now, skill feats are all associated with one of the 17 available skills and have additional prerequisites before you can take them. They require that you have a certain level of training in the associated skill, again, from trained up to legendary, and that you be a certain character level, very often though it's just level one. There are tons of skill feats, like I'm talking about a hundred, just in the core rule book. Obviously, not gonna discuss them all in great detail, but generally speaking, they're going to make you better at doing things with your skills, and oftentimes better at the actions that you can take with your skills when you're trained in them. So for example, with the steady balance skill feat, now when you're walking on that tightrope, you're going to critically succeed when you otherwise would just regularly succeed and not suffer any penalties that you otherwise would when you're trying to balance and walk on a tightrope. Or you might take the recognize spell skill feat if you're trained in the arcana skill. And that would let you use your reaction to try to recognize and identify an arcana spell that an enemy cast even if you yourself don't know that spell. Or you might take the powerful leap skill feat that lets you increase your jump distance by five feet, etc, etc, etc. Skill feats are just one more way for you to further specialize your character and help them mechanically embody the concept that you have for them. While we're talking about skill feats, let's expand the conversation to feats in general. As you can already tell, there are a ton more feats in Pathfinder 2 than there are in D&D 5e, and you gain them a lot more frequently. Aside from class, feats are really the main way for you to differentiate and specialize your character. There are five types of feats, ancestry feats and skill feats, which we've already discussed, as well as general feats, class feats, and archetype feats. You gain one or more of these feats at every single level, so that by the time you reach character level 20, you will have chosen over 30 feats. General feats are probably the closest thing to D&D's version of feats. There are fewer of them to choose from, only 17 in the core rulebook. You only get a few of them at levels 3, 7, 11, 15, and 19, and most of them don't have prerequisites. They tend to be pretty powerful things, letting you gain proficiency in armor or weapons, make you harder to make it more difficult to kill you once you've been knocked unconscious, increase your move speed, etc, etc. My favorite general feat, of course, is the adopted ancestry feat, which lets you take feats from another ancestry, aka race, right? Man! If D&D had this, I never would have got into that elven accuracy with custom lineage fiasco. <laughs> As for class and archetype feats, we'll discuss those in a minute after we go over the basics of classes. Right. 
The classes in the Pathfinder Core rulebook are basically the same as what you'll find in D&D with a couple of differences. Champions basically replace Paladins as a class, though there is a subclass of Champion called the Paladin. There are no Artificers, but there are Alchemists, and there are no Warlocks in Pathfinder. So that's a no to those of you who have been looking forward to me doing a Hexblade Warlock build in Pathfinder 2e, though I'm sure there are ways to tweak and play a spellcaster in a hopefully similar gishy way. As for subclasses, they seem to have a much reduced role in Pathfinder. In fact, monks and fighters don't even have subclass options. The rest of the classes do, and they all gain them at level one, but they don't seem to have nearly the same degree of impact on your character in Pathfinder. For example, a champion gets three choices of subclass based on their deity and alignment. They can either be a lawful good paladin, a neutral good redeemer, or a chaotic good liberator. Each one of those gain a different reaction and ability, and later on some of their class feats are only available to one but not the others. And that's pretty much it. Wizards, on the other hand, get to choose a spell school, specialization, evocation, necromancy, illusion, etc. And then they gain additional spell slots for spells from that school, as well as a couple low-level spells from that school. That's nice, but again, the biggest way, I think, to differentiate yourself from other characters of your same class is via the spells that you choose to take, if you're a spellcaster, of course. But otherwise, yes, class feats. You usually gain a class feat at first level and then at every numbered level thereafter, just like skill feats. Class feats though are generally a little more powerful and distinct and truly help turn you into the type of rogue or wizard or monk that you want to be. There are dozens of options for each class, so Again, there's no way that I'm gonna try and go into all of them here, but I will, I think, take a deeper dive into each class's feats if I end up doing character builds for Pathfinder like I've always done for D&D. Do know that you get other class features and abilities as well in your class, outside of class feats, and those features will increase the power for all members of your class, regardless of which class feats that they've been taking along the way. Okay, what about multi-classing? Yeah. Guess what? There is no multi-classing in Pathfinder 2e. Say what? Forget it. I'm out of here. Okay, calm down. Or maybe I'm just talking to myself here. Some of you are undoubtedly going to love this. Some will have some reservations. I know somebody like that. But okay, first of all, like I've been explaining, there are a ton of ways to customize and differentiate and specialize your character thanks to the myriad of feats that you will be getting along the way, not to mention spells you may learn or the equipment you decide to use, actually more on that in a bit. But also, there are what are called archetypes that sort of let you dabble into what I would consider multi-classing light. In a nutshell, instead of taking a class feat when a class feat is available, you could instead take an archetype feat. And this would give you access to some abilities or features or maybe even spells of a different class. So you could theoretically be, say, a monk level six, but have taken a couple of alchemist archetype feats along the way instead of your monk class feats you'd still gain the other non-class feat monk features as you leveled up. You just potentially would have passed on your monk class feats to take some alchemist archetype feats instead. Got it? All right, let's talk about equipment because I'm gonna be honest. As weird as this may sound, the way Pathfinder does equipment, especially weapons, might be my favorite thing about the game when compared to D&D. First up, there is a lot more diversity in the weapons. Not only are there just a ton more options, spiked chains, katanas, star knife, bastard sword, orc knuckle dagger, composite longbow, but every one of them is so much different from the rest due to the huge variety of weapon 
traits. There are over 30 weapon traits listed in the core rulebook, from Agile, which temporarily reduces the attack penalty you get when you make multiple attacks on your turn, more on that later, to the Backstabber trait, which does extra damage if an enemy is flat-footed. Okay, this is a condition that comes up all the time, so I'm going to explain it really quickly. Flat-footed just means that you have a minus two to your armor class. So if you were using a weapon that had the Backstabber trait, and you were attacking an enemy who was flat-footed, which is pretty easy to do, you're going to do extra damage. There's the deadly weapon trait, which increases damage on a critical hit, or the backswing trait, which gives you a plus one to hit on your next attack if you missed with your first. Forceful does extra damage on subsequent attacks this turn. Parry lets you use the weapon to increase your armor class. The sweep trait gives a plus to hit on a different target this turn, and on and on and on. Weapon traits make weapon choice so much more interesting and fun than in D&D 5e. And they give you a good reason to carry more than one weapon on you to be able to pull out depending on the situation. What's more, a lot of weapons get extra benefits when you critically hit with them. More on criticals later. So long as you have a feat or other feature that grants what's known as the critical specialization effect with that type of weapon. For example, dwarves can take an ancestry feat at level 5 that gives them access to critical specialization effects for all axes, picks, warhammers, or specific dwarf weapons like the clan dagger or dwarven war axe. Thereafter, if that dwarf was wielding an axe and they got a critical hit, since they have the critical specialization effect for axes, it would let you cleave into an adjacent enemy. If you had the critical specialization for bows and you got a critical hit with a bow, you could pin the enemy to the ground. With hammers, you could knock an enemy prone. Some weapons would apply persistent bleeding damage or cause your enemy to be flat-footed on a critical hit if you had the critical specialization for that type of weapon. So fun, and it really just adds a lot of versatility and power to weapon users, especially because getting critical hits are a little bit easier in Pathfinder than they are in D&D. You can even potentially raise your proficiency with certain types of weapon groups to increase your hit chance with them. Remember how I talked about there being five levels of proficiency? Untrained, trained, expert, master, legendary? Well, that applies to more than just skills. Anything you can be proficient or trained in, including weapons and even armor, get additional benefit from your training level with them. For example, fighters at level five get to choose one weapon type, say swords, and then their proficiency with swords goes up to master. Thereafter, that fighter would have a plus four to hit higher than if they were simply trained with martial weapons, including swords, right? And I love the idea of having a certain type of weapon that are like your favorites and that you really specialize and excel in. Again, just one more way to customize and differentiate your character. Since we're discussing proficiency, let's take a quick detour and dive a little deeper. Your proficiency bonus always benefits from your character level. It doesn't just go up by one at at levels 5, 9, 13, and 17 like D&D. So yes, if you're proficient in a skill, even if you're just like the base level trained proficient, you don't have to be expert or master, your bonus to that skill check goes up every time you gain a level, even if you didn't increase your level of training or your affiliated ability score modifier. Similarly, if you're proficient with a weapon, your chance to hit goes up every time you gain a level. Even if your ability score or training level didn't increase, your spell save DC and saving throws will similarly increase each level, and yes, even your armor class will go up every level if you're wearing armor that you're proficient in. And that's really different and kind of amazing. I think it creates a much smoother and more consistent scaling of all characters as you level, and that is something that I really appreciate. Though it also kind of creates the bonded math that people talk about in Pathfinder where character scaling is a lot more sort of predictable and same across all characters. And a lot of people argue that that makes it a little tougher to sort of optimize or min-max in Pathfinder. And I don't know, maybe one day I'll see if I can prove that theory. All right, speaking of armor, Armor still comes in light, medium, and heavy varieties, but you actually suffer both a move penalty and 
a penalty to your strength and dexterity skill checks if you don't meet the armor's strength requirements. Much more punishing, right, than D&D. What's more, even if you do meet the strength requirement for heavy armor exclusively, you'll still have a move penalty of five feet. Kind of makes sense, I think. Armor also has a lot more traits associated with it, such as comfort, which basically lets you sleep in it without suffering any penalties. Nice if you're in the middle of a dungeon trying to take a nap, right? Or bulwark, which means you have a plus three bonus to your reflex save or dex save against a fireball, for example, rather than your dexterity modifier. Shields come in a lot more varieties, from bucklers to tower shields, and they each provide varying degrees of AC bonus. Also, you don't actually get that bonus to your armor class unless you take an action on your turn to raise your shield. That may feel like a bit of a bummer, but you can also potentially get the shield block reaction from either a general feat or a class feature. And when you use that shield block reaction upon taking damage, you can further reduce the damage that you take. Though, interestingly, your shield might potentially take damage as well and can thus eventually be broken and would need repair. Crunchy. Okay, the final thing I will discuss with character creation is saving throws. Pathfinder only has three saving throw types and everyone is proficient in each of them. Fortitude, which is affected by your constitution score, will, affected by wisdom, and reflex, affected by dexterity. I think I prefer the greater saving throw simplicity here. I mean, what is a charisma saving throw anyway? You can, through feats and features, raise your training level in saving throws from trained all the way up to legendary, greatly increasing your saving throw scores in addition to the bump that they get from your level and from increasing your ability scores as you level. So lots of ways to raise those. Okay, let's move on to part two, combat. Probably the biggest difference between how combat works in Pathfinder versus D&D is that Pathfinder uses what's known as the three action economy. Every character, every turn gets three actions. Bonus actions don't exist, just three actions. And before you get too excited about how many actions that is, it's like everyone has haste and action surge all the time. Just about everything you do in Pathfinder requires an action. Movement, picking up a weapon, opening a door, making a weapon attack, aka a strike, all of those things require one of your three actions. So no, you do not have a separate ability to move outside of your actions. Commonly on their turn, a melee character might move into position, aka stride, with their first action, then make two strikes with their second and third actions. Now, some more powerful actions cost multiple actions. So you might have to spend two or even all three of your actions to do a certain thing. Those are called activities. The most common type of activity is a spell, and most spells require more than one action to cast. More on spells later. Another important thing to know is that most actions have traits associated with them. These are things like the move trait, or attack trait, or manipulate trait, or even concentrate trait, which is not the same thing as it is in D&D. It's important to know these traits simply because a lot of times things might happen in the game as a result of you taking a move action or attack action. These traits are simply identifiers to group different types of actions together, if that makes sense. For example, you may be thinking what I was thinking when I first learned about the three action economy. So wait, that means I could attack an enemy three times in a turn right at level one? Awesome. <laughs> Well, kind of. So yes, all three of your actions could be used to make a strike, but for each additional attack action you make on your turn, you suffer an increasing penalty to hit. The first attack action is made as normal. If your character has a plus seven to hit, then you roll the d20 and add seven to the roll. The second attack in a turn though has a minus five penalty to hit. So now your total chance to hit would just be plus two, right? You had plus seven, minus five, now you're plus two. If you decided to try for a third attack on that turn, it would be made at a minus 10 to hit. So that same character would now have a minus three to hit on their third attack in a turn, right? Ouch. Still, having the ability to 
strike three times if you really needed or wanted to is pretty cool. Also, importantly, if your weapon has the agile trait, then the attack penalty is reduced to a minus four and a minus eight, respectively. A little better, but still painful. The reason knowing about traits associated with different actions in this case is that strikes aren't the only type of action with the attack trait. Strikes are basically weapon attacks and unarmed attacks. They have the attack trait associated with them, but so does grappling or shoving a creature. And thus, those actions too would similarly suffer from the multi-attack penalty on your turn. So you need to think very carefully about what order you make your attack actions in if you're going to be making multiple attack actions on your turn. And yeah, that even includes spell attacks. That said, there are a lot more actions you can take on your turn in Pathfinder besides just attacks. In D&D, your actions are basically limited to attack, cast a spell, dash, disengage, dodge, ready, search, use an object, and then anything else that your class or subclass or feat may allow, right? With Pathfinder, there are way more potential actions you can take in combat. And that's a good thing since you get three turns every turn, but the penalty for just attacking with all three of them gets really steep really quickly. Like we've already talked about a little bit, there are a ton of actions, first of all, that are tied to your skills, whether trained or untrained. So many. Things like tumble through to get through an enemy's space, recall knowledge, create a diversion, faint, demoralize, I'm going to highlight that later, administer first aid, disarm, and many, many more. There are also plenty of basic actions that anyone can do which are not tied to skills. Things like aid, which is sort of like help in D&D, but slightly more complicated and slightly less mechanically beneficial. Take cover if you're already behind cover, increasing the benefit of said cover. I'm going to talk about cover more later. Delay. Yeah, you can just intentionally wait to take your turn if it makes sense for you to go after somebody else in the initiative order. Why not? I love all of these additional possible actions because it makes combat feel a lot more tactical. You could just attack for a third time at a minus 10 to hit, sure. Or you could try to demoralize your enemy and cause them to become frightened. It makes skills a lot more important both in combat and out of combat. And it also gives characters a lot more to do in combat than just attack, right? And I think as a result, it just has the potential to keep combat a lot more interesting and engaging. Now, some things are considered free actions and they don't require one of your three actions, right? Dropping an item, for example, doesn't cost you an action, but there don't seem to be all that many of them in Pathfinder. More often than not, something's going to take one of your actions. Also, everyone does get a reaction per round, but as far as I know, there aren't any reactions that every character just automatically knows. Even opportunity attacks are something that you have to like be a certain class to get or maybe pick up with a feat. Lots of enemies do have the ability to make opportunity attacks though, so it's important to understand how it works. First off, opportunity attacks are a bit more powerful in Pathfinder, triggering if someone simply takes a move action while within your reach, not just if they move away from you. So standing up from prone, which is an action and it has the move trait tied to it, would trigger an attack of opportunity if there were an enemy within melee striking distance when you stood up. That feels like something you could have fun building around. Also, if you're standing right next to your enemy and you want to like skirt around them without leaving their reach, right? You're still taking a move action while within their reach and thus could trigger an attack of opportunity. Actually, making a ranged attack from within reach of an enemy also triggers an attack of opportunity. So does taking a manipulate action. So like interacting with an object, for example, which could simply be drawing or stowing a weapon. Now, since we've been on the subject of movement, let's discuss some additional movement differences. First up, the only movement action that does not trigger an attack of opportunity is the step action. Step is a way to move just five feet, but without provoking opportunity attacks. 
So it's kind of like taking the disengage action, but you also get to move a little bit, which is nice. Otherwise, it's important to understand that when you stride, which is what it's called when you take an action to just move up to your move speed, you don't get to like use some of your movement, then make an attack, for example, and then use the rest of your movement. Again, movement is not a separate thing. You take the stride action, move up to your move speed, then that stride action is done and you do your next action, making an attack, casting a spell, whatever. If you want to move again, you're going to need to spend another action to do so. Also, Pathfinder is a little more crunchy when it comes to diagonal movement. If you're playing on a grid in D&D, you can move up, down, left, right, or diagonal, and all of those just cost five feet, right? In Pathfinder 2, your first diagonal square of movement only costs five feet, but your second in that same movement action costs 10. Similarly, when you cast a spell with an area of effect that has like a diameter or a sphere, it actually makes a true circle or sphere, rather than a square in D&D. If that confuses you, watch this video by a Triant Monk who explains it rather well. Related to movement, terrain comes in a lot more shapes and sizes in Pathfinder. Difficult terrain exists and functions similarly, cutting your move speed in half, but there's also greater difficult terrain, which cuts it by two thirds, as well as hazardous terrain that can potentially hurt you, think spike growth, narrow terrain and uneven terrain, which requires you to balance or risk falling and landing prone. Not to mention it also causes you to be flat footed when you're on it or inclined terrain, which forces you to use your athletics skill to climb and also causes you to be flat footed. Some potential, okay, let's discuss some positions and tactical things to consider in combat. First, cover. Pathfinder 2 identifies three types of cover, lesser, standard, and greater cover, similar to half, three quarters, and full in D&D. Each type of cover gives a bonus to armor class, but standard cover and greater cover also allow you to try and hide, give bonuses to stealth checks, and reflex saves to avoid taking damage from things like fireballs. Lesser cover gives a plus one bonus, standard a plus two, and greater a plus four. As far as determining what kind of cover you have, it's fairly intuitive. If the line between you and an enemy passes through blocking terrain, you've got standard cover. If it's a lot of blocking terrain, it would be greater cover. And if it's just foliage or something light, or Importantly, even another creature, even an ally potentially, you would have lesser cover. The GM will often have to arbitrate here what's what. Now, here is a favorite thing. Flanking is officially part of the rules in Pathfinder 2 and not listed as an optional rule. Who freaking Ray? You flank an enemy if you and an ally are within melee range of the enemy, are not prohibited from making a melee or unarmed strike against them, and you can draw a line to each other that passes through opposite ends of the enemy's space. Basically, you can't just be side by side with your ally here, or even diagonal from them. One of you legitimately has to be like behind them. When that's the case, the enemy is flat-footed to you and your ally flanking them, but not the rest of the party necessarily. Okay, so a fight breaks out. Roll initiative, right? As far as initiative goes, in Pathfinder 2, it's determined by your wisdom, not your dexterity. When you roll for initiative, everyone makes a perception check. Highest check goes first. Yeah, dexterity is definitely not the god stat in Pathfinder, like it is in D&D. In fact, when you're making ranged weapon attacks, you don't even get to add your dexterity modifier to the damage, nor your strength, unless it's a thrown weapon, or it has a certain trait associated with it, in which case it lets you add half of your strength score. Sorry, dex. Okay, ready to discuss taking damage? First off, let's explain criticals. Critical hits do exist in Pathfinder, but they are so much better than they are in D&D. What's more, Critical failures also exist, but guess what? Critical successes and failures exist for almost everything you do in game, and I kinda love it. Here's how the critical rules work in Pathfinder. If you exceed a check by 10 or more, whether it's an attack against an enemy armor class or a skill check against a set DC, etc., it's a critical success. Conversely, if you fail a check by 10 or more, it's a critical failure. Natural 20s and natural 1s don't automatically result in a critical success or failure, but they usually do. So you want to think of it as a spectrum. You have critical critical failures, failures, successes, and critical successes, right? Four potential outcomes. 
if you roll a natural 20, it increases whatever your total check score was by one category on this spectrum. Not an automatic crit, but probably. For example, if the enemy has a 30 armor class, totally possible in Pathfinder. Numbers generally seem to get a lot higher in this game in my limited experience thus far. And you only have, say, a plus nine to hit, well, even if you rolled a 20, you would still miss, right? 20 plus 9, 29, and you needed a 30. Except that since you rolled a 20, it bumps your check up by one category, thus turning it from a miss into just a regular hit. Hey, at least you didn't miss. Similarly, a natural 1 doesn't automatically mean a critical failure or even a failure. It just bumps the check down a category. Let's say you roll a nat 1 on a skill check, but you have a plus 20 to your bonus, and the DC was only a 10. Well, you roll a 1, that would be 21, which is a critical success since you beat the DC by more than 10, right? Except that rolling that nat 1 lowered your check by one category, knocking it down from a critical success to just a regular success. Still a success though, not even a failure for rolling a nat one, let alone a crit fail. But yes, by and large, rolling a natural one or a natural 20 is going to result in a critical failure or success respectively. And yeah, like I said, you can crit succeed and fail on almost everything. And there are usually very specific things that happen on crit successes and failures laid out for most actions and spells. Get a critical success on an attempt to trip your enemy, and your target is not only knocked prone, but takes a little extra damage too. Crit fail though, and you are knocked prone. <laughs> oh, that's kind of awesome. I mean, even saving throws critically succeed on your save against a spell, and you might take no damage instead of half. Don't need evasion. Crit fail, and you might take double damage. Dang. No, I kind of love it. As for strikes or weapon attacks, if you get a critical success, you just straight up double the damage, not just the dice, but modifiers as well, and thank you. I mean, this really removes the likelihood of getting a critical hit on an enemy rolling two ones and feeling like, man, that crit did less damage than my regular attacks usually do. Oh, bother. Somewhat surprisingly, strikes are one of the only things that can't critically fail. I guess they figured that just missing your target was bad enough. As for hit points and taking damage, both work very similarly in Pathfinder and D&D, but being knocked unconscious and death are pretty different. When you are reduced to zero hit points, a few things happen. First, your initiative order is changed to be right before the creature who knocked you out. Getting knocked out gives you the dying one condition, unless it was a crit, in which case you get the dying two condition. If you take damage while you're knocked out, it automatically moves your dying condition up by one. When you get to dying four, you're dead. Now, you do get to make death saves, known as recovery checks, but it gets progressively harder the higher your dying condition is. As the DC isn't just a flat 10 like it is in D&D, but 10 plus your dying condition. Every success reduces your dying condition by one, every failure increases it by one, and as with just about everything, critical successes and failures can happen, moving it by two. Now, if you just death save your way out of being knocked unconscious, you stay unconscious but stable. If you ever get healed by even one hit point, you lose all dying conditions, similar to D&D. But here's a big difference. Regardless of how you come out of the dying condition, you acquire the wounded condition. The first time it happens, you're wounded one. The second time, you're wounded two, and so on. But if you get knocked out again while you have the wounded condition, you add your wounded condition number to your dying condition number. So. If you're wounded too, meaning that you've already been bounced back from unconscious twice, right? And you get knocked out a third time, you are now at dying three. One single failed recovery check or instance of damage and you are toast. And yeah, that's a lot more punishing than in D&D's version, but I like it. It raises the stakes while not being so brutal that if you get knocked to zero hit points, you just die. But yeah, gone will be the days of just kind of letting your ally get knocked unconscious and nonchalantly bouncing them back up with a first level healing word spell as a bonus action, right? Now, with the wounded condition, you don't lose it until you are restored to full hit points and rest for 10 minutes. 
or if someone restores hit points to you with the treat wounds action, which requires healer's tools and medicine skill proficiency. It's not a spell. We're going to need actual bandages here. One way you can cheese death a little bit here, I guess, is by spending a hero point. If you have at least one hero point at the start of your turn, you can spend all of your hero points to recover from dying with one hit point, and you don't even gain or increase your wounded condition. Pretty nice, but only usable with hero points which don't exactly grow on trees. What are hero points, you may ask? They're similar to inspiration. They let you re-roll failed checks, but the differences are every session your character just automatically starts with one and you can hold up to three hero points at a time if your DM rewards you with more of them for good roleplay, etc. similar to inspiration. Anyway, by making getting knocked out so punishing, you're probably assuming that Pathfinder has made healing a lot easier, yeah? Eh, not necessarily. First up, Pathfinder 2 does not really have short and long rests. You can potentially take 10 minutes between combat to heal up a bit via a medicine check and healer's tools, like I mentioned, and to recover what are known as focus points. More on that later. Those kinds of things you could do between combat encounters, but that's really all we get for what we might think of as a short rest. And then, yeah, once per 24 hours, you can rest for a longer period of time. We're told typically eight hours, but it seems a little loosey-goosey, but this is Pathfinder's version of a long rest. Completing this rest allows you to recover your spell slots and anything else that gets used up on a daily basis, but you don't necessarily heal to full health. Instead, you heal a number of hit points equal to your constitution modifier times your level. So if you have a 14 con and you're level five, you would take this rest and you'd only heal 10 hit points. If you spend an entire day and night, you can recover con modifier times twice your level. Still maybe not full health. Making healing spells and abilities even more important in Pathfinder 2, I think. And for that reason, yes, I think it's super important to understand the power of having a couple people in your party with proficiency in the medicine skill and healer's tools, which are fairly inexpensive and have unlimited uses. In this way, you can attempt to administer first aid aid on a creature, stopping their bleeding or stabilizing them, treat a disease, treat poison, and above all, treat wounds, which, like I've talked about, lets you heal someone, but no more than once per hour, so long as you can spend 10 minutes doing so and succeed on a medicine check of a DC 15. If you succeed, the target regains 2d8 hit points and has the wounded condition removed. If you critically succeed, they regain 4d8 hit points. But of course, if you critically fail, they lose 1d8 hit points. <laughs> Ouch. I hope you have malpractice insurance. You could kill your patient. But yeah, in the end, healing in Pathfinder seems both more important and maybe harder to come by. No spending hit dice on a short rest to heal up. No recovering to full health with a long rest. And yeah, going unconscious is a lot more punishing. If you really love the idea of playing a battlefield medic, Pathfinder 2 might be your game. All right. I think that pretty much covers everything we need to know about the differences in combat. So let's move on to spells. New favorite shirt. Zero bothers given. We could all use a little more Pooh Bear in our lives, I think. Whew. This is long. <laughs>